Well, thank you for taking the time. Aside from doing press, days going okay? Yeah, um, you know, there's always a lot going on. I have I have a teenager, so need I say more? Um, right. The uh, having a teenager is a part of the red light green light album because it's an introspective album. But um, is that the latest and the greatest thing to talk about the red light green light album? That is. It's still very new for me. And, uh, you know, it's exciting to play these songs live, too. That's part of why I, I decided to write the album. I just I was craving, you know, new material. And it's we just did an East Coast run and it was amazing. And it felt so good to play these songs. I heard that a choir was brought out at the New York show a week or so ago. Yeah, we had the Harlem Gospel Choir, uh, which was an incredible honor because, you know, I don't know, I'm just moved by that soul music. And uh, it was it was just a gift to have them on Search of My Soul. Um, and now I'm kind of spoiled, you know, <laughs> it's like whenever I sing that song, I'm going to want to hear the choir. So I'll hear it in my head. You have New York roots. I know that you also grew up in Los Angeles, but where in New York did you originally grow up? Well, I, if you can count uh, living there till I was a year and a half, I grew up in Manhattan. I was born in Manhattan. So, and and my my father actually was a theater critic in New York. So I, I have a lot of New York roots and uh, he lived there later, you know, and I would go back a couple times a year and go see all the Broadway shows and he'd get us house seats. So, you know, it was great. Definitely a good perk. Well, hey, back to that new album made at the height of the pandemic with your husband, who's a fantastic producer. I first learned about him from the soul coughing album that's named after Ruby. And then after that, you realize, wow, this guy works with the best people, yourself included. Did you know outright, hey, I want my husband to work on this album? Uh, absolutely. Um, and it was kind of the other way around because I was actually a, a fan of his before I ever met him. And sorry, I'm going to switch glasses. I can't get the right distance but that's good um so, so when I was doing my second album I was working um with Don was and he said hey how about Mitchell Froome on B3 and I said what can we get him you know I was a huge fan of Mitchell's so uh so I said yes and I, that's when I met him so it was around 1990 uh we both were in other relationships so he has been my favorite producer for you know this whole time and so the answer to your question is yes. I definitely, you know, it was a given that he was going to do the album. This is our eighth album together. It is seven years since your last full length album before you got this one out. In your case, was it a, hey, why do I need to make albums when I can tour and do singles? Or was a writer's block or all the above? I wouldn't say it was writer's block, but I would say I, I you know, I, I realized I was a little burnt out, you know, and writing is so hard. It's the hardest yet most probably most gratifying thing I do. Mm -hmm. So it just took a certain, you know, it took a certain kind of uh, decision and energy to commit to making a whole album. And, you know, talking to Mitchell, he would say, just, you know, get one song and then get two songs and then, you know, chip away. And that's, I knew that, but it's overwhelming to think I'm going to write an album. So I needed a little nudge there. You, so you didn't have a publishing company going, hey, you owe us the quota of the songs. This was entirely a, I got to do this. This is my creative release. Absolutely. And and it's, it, you know, having new material infuses your whole life with energy, mm -hmm. with new energy. Even if I only play one or two songs live, the whole show feels different. You know, it feels like uh, it's got a new spark to it. And it kind of spreads throughout the set as well. So got I'm it. really happy. Did it, yeah. So looking at your upcoming touring, they're touting, hey, the 25th anniversary of Valley McBeal. But of course, you have this new record. When somebody sees you live in, say, the Netherlands versus New York, is it the same set list or is it, hey, these songs were hits in this country? Because I know that your roots go back to the Dan Hill cover and your first, the Dan Hill duet and the first major label deal and all that. And for all I know, those were number one hits in the Netherlands. You know, that's a good question. Um, I feel like my crowd in um, in Europe and overseas is a little younger, and they seem to have my solo albums as much as my Ali album. So, like, it's Good Eve. I've got hardcore European fans that want to hear a, a Lucky Life or a Grain of Sand or something. So mm -hmm. I feel comfortable over there. Yeah, so I feel comfortable over there kind of doing whatever I want. And that being said, I do have 
some hardcore Ali fans all over the world. Um, the album was number one in a lot of countries. And, and it would be kind of lame of me to not play some of those tunes. Um, Search in My Soul I wrote, you know, so I feel good playing that. Right. Tell Him, Tell Him is, a, is a hit that was on, on the album that was uh, really, it's actually fun to do live. And by the end of the show, after I do some of my, you know, my stuff that I like to do, at the end of the show, I get up with my guitar player and dance around. And, and it's actually, I blow off a lot of steam. The audience goes crazy and it's, it's fun. Got it. But it was the same hits more or less all over the world for your career. I, th this is a fascinating thing to me because, for example, when I spoke with the singer of the band The Church the mm. other day, he's saying Under the Milky Way was only a U.S. hit. It wasn't a hit in Australia or the U.K. So I didn't know if Searching My Soul was number one everywhere. The Dan Hill hit was everywhere, et cetera. You know, I, you're making me realize I should, I should have asked that question and, and dug into that to, to do my research before I hit a country, but I, I didn't. Um, uh, the one thing I do know is Search of My Soul was number one or two, you know, in many, many countries. I have a lot of those platinum album plaques from like <laughs> Taiwan and you know, the Philippines and, and Spain. And I mean, it was number one in Spain for four weeks uh, on the, al the album chart. And so, yeah, so I always do Search of My Soul. Maryland is one of my most known songs that I wrote and it's on a couple of albums. So, so it's on an Alley album, but it's also on It's Good Eve. So that one's in, that's in, and I like it. <laughs> Where do the plaques go? Some artists just have them in a storage unit and others have the plaque room in their house, like their office Zoom call room. I know, I can't do that. I have them in my tool shed. <laughs> our our Mitch like, is... Uh, are Mitch's uh, plaques there as well? Yes, we have, um, I'm not bragging, but we have a, quite a large stack and they're covered with like packing blankets. And you know what we should do? I was thinking is is auction them off for charity. And we should do that because someone might want them before they disintegrate, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the spray painted Frank Sinatra records with the gold paint. But, <laughs> did you ever hear that rumor that all that's what all the platinum and gold records are? They're spray painted Sinatra records that were in excess? I did not know that. That's great. I don't know if that's true, but uh, I don't want to be sued by libel. So uh, for libel. So <laughs> allegedly they're Frank yeah. Sinatra record. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so back to you. Having finished this album, did that spark creativity in that you go, hey, I want to do another one or is it still one album at a time? Well, you know, I, I write in a journal, um, you know, as often as I can on a daily basis. And I was writing to myself, it would be very wise to continue the creative process because now I'm on, you know, I'm on the train, we're going, we're chugging along. So, and and I actually did come up with a couple of ideas and I have them on my phone. And and it's, it's really, uh, it's like a window, almost like a spiritual creative window that closes if you don't, well, closes now let's do a sliding side window um it, it really can shut down and i like as we're talking i'm thinking as soon as we get off the phone i'm going to go listen to some of those ideas and maybe try to dig in and work on them a little bit so thanks <laughs> when you are writing do you do fully produced demos or is it just piano and vocal um I do my own piano vocal, very simple, but Mitchell and I, when we work together, he he helps me, you know, he'll come up with some bass parts, he'll get a groove, and then we'll end up recutting most of it. Um, on Red Light, Green Light, the actual song, he came up with a cool drum groove, and I think that's just his programmed drum. I'm pretty sure, <laughs> I might be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure. Um, but he he really d does a lot of arrangements in advance, and we sit together in this room. This is our this is my pub. I know it's see that's the piano right there. Yeah, it's just it's a good writing room because it's got reverb and you know feels good in here. It's like a funky club. So um, yeah, so so he he and I sit here. He sits in the chair right there and like nods his head while I play the song, and he comes up with a cool idea. It's just so cool, and it's really fun working with him. So piano next to you, how often do you tune it? That is a real, real question because I hear people who, if they're on the road, they tune it every day and other people go, nah, I like it with the funk element of it being a little out of tune. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's that expression, the dirt keeps the funk. The dirt the, keeps the funk. <laughs> James Jamerson Jr. or Senior from the Funk Brothers. Um, yep. Yeah. 
the dirt keeps the funk. So we tune this piano about every six months, which is <laughs> really bad. Um, but when, when it starts really bugging me, because Mitchell and I both don't mind a little, a little out of tune, you know, edge, you know, wavering. Uh, the piano in the studio, uh, we tune every time there's a project and Mitchell's, you know, out there today working. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Back to you here. Two last questions, then I'm going to let you roam free. Uh, the first one is, as I mentioned before, you look at the website of Ms. Vonda Shepard and you see, hey, she is touring your big time in the coming months. This is a new record. Are you looking at 2024 already or are you a one year at a time kind of artist? We are actually looking at 2024. In fact, um, recently, a couple of days ago, I was on the East Coast playing for a thing called APAP, which is the Performing Arts Center's buyers. So I did a couple of showcases for them, like, hey, this is me, this is what I do. And uh, from that, we're hoping to get 2024 booked for some performing arts centers all around the country. Because a lot of my fans say, you know, why do you always go to Europe? Why don't you ever come here? What's wrong with us? And I'm like, it's not you. <laughs> right, the performance art, center the pack kind of venue is is a hard world to get into but then once you're into that then you know the city wineries of the world want you and so fingers crossed for apap paying off and my last question which is a dumb one is <laughs> when most people think of you and music they think of more soul r b 60s pop influences but did you ever have a metal or a hard rock phase I listened to some hard rock. Like I, I was a huge Soundgarden fan, you know, at the gym, just blasting it and lifting weights. And, you know, so I, I like it. Uh, it's not what I do personally, you know, just so you know. And before you go, I have to mention this because um, we, we manufactured vinyl, but it's back ordered like four months. So eventually on my website, I will have vinyl of red light, green light. And I have CDs on my website that people can just buy, you know, and my my friend over here will mail them out. <laughs> So cool. Physical goods. They keep, wow. they always keep 10 to 15% of the diehards happy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it and there's, right. Okay. <laughs> and there's enough diehards out there. Well, either way, I look forward to your next New York gig and keep up all the greatness. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Thanks. me.